Omicron variant of COVID. But uh, uh, I hope all of you are fine. And it's nice to see so many people from all across the country. Uh, so if you've had um, about 12 sessions uh, till now, then I'm sure some of the things I say will be repetitive. But my main focus of my chat, uh, talk today will be uh, uh, the scope of palliative care in respiratory medicine, because I think all of you know, historically, everybody has uh, in their minds before joining any training session of palliative care, historically, palliative care started for patients with advanced cancers, those who were terminally ill. <clears throat> and the main scope of my talk today is to tell you how important palliative care is in non-cancer conditions and not at the end of life. So without wasting much time, we'll uh, go ahead with the presentation. And I would really love, like it and request all of you to make it an interesting session by making it interactive. So I learn from you and you can learn from me better. Please stop me if you are not understood anything, I'm happy to repeat it. And if you want me to go slower, I'm happy to do that also. I tend to talk a bit fast as I go on talking. So please remind me to go slow. Feel free to use the chat box. There is uh, Sri at Pal in Pallium India who is going to uh, pick up the questions, but I'm also looking at the chat box. So please feel free. So to start with, I want to just uh, let you know that <clears throat> according to the census uh, of the number of illnesses prevalent amongst Indians, it is very evident that non-communicable diseases, which can also be called as non-cancer diseases, are on the rise, not just in India, but globally. And if you see this chart, you can see that Illnesses like hypertension, diabetes, cardiac events, stroke, uh, COPD, tuberculosis, respiratory illnesses cause a major chunk of patients in India who are affected by it. Yes, we do add 1 million new cancer patients every year to the list, but the amount of people affected by these lifestyle illnesses is way more than cancer. Second thing, all of you know that diseases like smoking-related illness, like COPD, to illnesses like heart disease, diabetes, blood pressure, dyslipidemia, stroke, etc., cannot be completely cured. Yes, it can be kept under control, but it cannot be completely cured. Therefore, the need of these patients to have a palliative care in their treatment is extremely important because it helps these patients deal with the consequences, deal with the emergencies of all these situations. So please remember that it is important to think of palliative care in those conditions which are progressive, which are chronic, and to a large extent incurable. So this was the, focus, the idea of putting up this slide was to let you know that the amount of Indians affected by these lifestyle diseases is a lot. Therefore, all systems, neurology, gastroenterology, respiratory, cardiology, all these need an influence of palliative care, especially in incurable progressive illness. So another chart to let you know how over the years, TB has also become a big burden in India because of MDR-TB, XDR-TB and totally drug-resistant tuberculosis. And this is not just a person who is affected by TB, but the whole family suffers with that particular patient. Similarly, the incidence of COPD as well as interstitial lung disease, which has been progressively increasing in India. Now, all of you <clears throat> must be very familiar with this, uh, with this graph, which must have been shown to you by some of the other faculty members. And this is just to highlight, if you divide the manner in which people die in the world, it can be broadly divided into these four categories, where graph A is when the patient has had a sudden death, graph B, which is typically seen in patients with cancer, graph C is what we need to focus on. And what does graph C actually show? Graph C clearly shows you that once a patient is diagnosed to have a chronic advanced respiratory, uh, sorry, chronic respiratory disease, say like COPD or interstitial lung disease, he leads a life of high symptom burden with 
towards around a prolonged period of time. So typically they get diagnosed say at the age of 60 or 65 and they live till up to 80 with the symptoms or diagnosis of COPD or emphysema. But how is their journey? Their life is punctuated by frequent hospital admissions as noticed by these dips. And these are the acute exacerbations or infective exacerbations. And if you notice, the patient never really comes back to his original quality of life. He lives a life which is slowly decaying, slowly worsening quality of life with high symptom burden. He first gets cough, then he gets breathless, then he gets infected, then he's dependent on oxygen, then he gets onto NIV. So this whole journey is punctuated by frequent hospital admissions and eventually resulting in death. And you and me both know that we are not able to alter the anatomy of the lung, which is caused by smoking. Therefore, these patients are what we are going to focus on today. And that is why it is important to integrate palliative care in uh, the care of the respiratory medicine also. Another way to emphasize to you about why it is important to have palliative care along with respiratory medicine, having been a pulmonologist myself, I practiced respiratory medicine very differently five years ago till I became a palliative care physician. If you think of a patient falling off a skyscraper as compared to falling off a chronic disease skyscraper, the manner in which you fall directly results on the way you land. So if the fall of the patient, which is clinical deterioration of the patient, is punctuated with frequent, unhurried, sensitive conversations about his worsening health, the patient and the family have time to prepare themselves of what they are going to meet. Please do remember, for that particular patient and the family, they have only seen one patient of COPD or one patient of interstitial lung disease. Therefore, it is the onus of the doctors, the respiratory physicians, to tell them the natural course of the illness, how this illness is going to progress and emphasize that what you are treating them with is only symptomatic treatment. The inhalers, the steroids, the derifilin, those medications are only going to control his symptoms. They are not going to change the anatomy of the lung. Therefore, it is the onus of the doctors to foresee and foretell and prepare these patients for an eventuality and not land up in the casualty breathless with type 1 or type 2 respiratory failure. And then it's just a conveyor belt where the patient goes to ICU, patient goes on the ventilator, patient is stuck to the ventilator. <clears throat> And there is a joke amongst the palliative care physicians that corporate hospitals where the rich cannot come out and the poor cannot go in. So that is what the faith is in amongst doctors. We need to be honest and have these conversations, difficult dialogues with our patients so that we prepare them better, avoid unnecessary ICU admissions, avoid unnecessary aggressive medical treatment especially in those people who are suffering from a background of incurable illness. So what do we aim and what do we achieve? That by the time I need palliative care, there is integration of palliative care along with curative care. Now I receive a call when the patient is in ICU, when it is two centimeters away from intubation. It's too late. I cannot appear there as a stranger and have a rapport with the family and discuss very sensitive matters of death and dying with absolute strangers. Therefore, if its palliative care is integrated along with the curative care, then it saves the time and effort of pulmonologists, neurologists, oncologists to do their bit and palliative care specialists will take care of the holistic care, which is emotional, psychological, social, spiritual, financial, handhold these patients, help them prepare for end of life and eventual death. So that the quality of death in our country, which is currently at the 59th position, was 67th in five years ago, will also improve. Today, Indians are dying in agony across the socio-economic status. The rich die on the ventilator. The middle class die, after, die on uh, with uh, ignorance. And the lower middle class and the poor die just simply because of negligence. But there is agony, there is suffering across the socioeconomic. And that is what palliative care aims to alleviate health-related suffering by early integration along with curative care. Any thoughts, any points, anything to discuss uh, or if you want 
uh, if I'm or uh, anything that you need to be cl clarified, please let me know. So the next question, when we say early integration of palliative care, the next question that I commonly face amongst pulmonologists or any specialist is if I refer to palliative care, it means I'm giving up. Patients feel loss of hope. Patients feel, oh God, I'm going to die. Therefore, the timing of referral is also very, very important. So there's this interesting paper which has been researched in England. As family physicians, as primary consultants, you in your mind think when the patient is sitting in front of you in the OPD, will you be surprised if this person will be uh, not alive in the next one year? If the question answers in your mind is no, that is you will not be surprised if this patient is dead in the next one year, that is the time for proactive palliative care, which means it gives you one whole year to discuss these difficult matters with the patient, to talk to the family, to get the family, the patient, the family physician all on the same page and to plan this patient's end of life and emergency. What to do in an emergency? When to go to ICU? Should you go to ICU? And most important, ask the patient what he wants to do. It is his life. His body, it has to be his choice. But for the patient to make a decision, he needs to have all the information. And that information has to come from doctors. So to simplify this further, there are two documents which I will be sharing uh, in the end. I'm sure even Pallium India can share with you, which is the gold standard framework and the blue maple document, which clearly defines indications of when to refer to palliative care. And I have only put up for COPD here because that's the topic relevant for today. And in a patient of chronic obstructive lung disease, if the patient has any two of this criteria, which two, either it's recurrent hospital uh, admissions <clears throat> or a breathlessness scale of four to five on the modified medical research council, or if the patient's deterioration in lung function test, patient on 24 seven oxygen or needs an ICU admission with an NIV, or other severe, strong comorbid factors. So patient has to satisfy only two of these criteria to be referred to palliative care, to have a better outcome of his illness, to have a better quality of life and to avoid aggressive medical treatment. So these are the two documents I was talking about. We will and we can share with you. Correct, Shri? We can send it to the participants. Yes, ma'am, we can send it. Again. Yeah, so please, will you do that? Sure, ma'am. Thank you. So just to also let you know that research which has been done and published in the West showed that people who were admitted in the casualty, 80% of cancer patients got palliative care, while less than 2% of patients even abroad with non-cancer conditions got palliative care. And the other sad part is those without palliative care interference or integration did ended up getting more invasive interventions at the end of life. Their fewer symptoms were documented. So they died in agony and also fewer analgesics, fewer medications were subscribed to them and they ended up getting more of uh, the cardiopulmonary resuscitation, which is actually very, in an advanced respiratory lung disease, doing a CPR is totally futile. At least let's give the patients the dignity and respect that they deserve to treat them well just before they die. So there are enough evidence to suggest that people are dying poorly. There is a lot you and me can do to improve their journey in the difficult chronic illness journey as well as at end of life. And the other thing that you need to realize is even those people who got admitted in the ICU for COPD, hardly one fourth of them were alive and well with a good quality of life. Otherwise, they end up getting constantly readmitted. And as hospital doctors, we see them only when they come to the hospital. We don't realize when they go home, what their quality of life is. Are they able to walk? Are they able to talk? Do they brush their teeth on their own? Do they go to the toilet on their own? How are they eating? Small, small things we never even bother. We realize only when we have a patient at home that getting a patient from the hospital who is not independent can be a real challenge for people, family caregivers. 
So please remember that even if you've admitted a COPD patient in the ICU, there is a mortality which is very high once they get discharged. So we really need to question about the selection of our patients in the ICU, especially in a resource crunch country like India, just because the patient can afford an ICU should not be the indication of patient going into ICU because the health related suffering for that particular individual is very, very high when he's admitted unnecessarily in the ICU. So what do you do? How do you evaluate a patient with a chronic respiratory disease? These are the things that you already know that we need a detailed history. Just a paper on the face, it really reduces the sensation of breathlessness and also the caregivers feel they're actually helping the patient in overcoming their distress. Simple massages, music therapy, acupressure can all distract the patient from his anxiety and therefore his breathlessness. You need to teach the patient energy conserving techniques like sit and shower, plan your a cooking session. Suppose a patient has to cook, then he removes everything he or she and then starts cooking. Because what you and me do, we put the pan, then we go looking for the oil, then the mustard seeds. So this can tire a patient with an advanced lung disease. So he should plan his uh, activity, pace himself slowly, prioritize what is important and therefore not do what is not important. All these simple, simple things can be taught to the patient which will be done by counselors, which is done by also by physiotherapists. They play a huge role and also the family caregivers can be roped in to support the patient so that in an acute event, they exactly know what to do. Pharmacological, of course, all of you know about it. You all have learned about it. Uh, there are bronchodilators, steroids, antibiotics in indicated situations like an infection. So antifibrotics in interstitial lung disease. What I really need to raise caution for is uh, the use of oxygen. We all saw in the second wave of the COVID how we went, we, we lost patients because of lack of oxygen in this country. Because unfortunately, there is a lot of use and abuse of oxygen. Patients are given oxygen even when there is no need. So at this stage, I would like to hi highlight to you that you should use oxygen when the saturation on the pulse oximeter is less than 88. Just because a patient is breathless is not an indication for oxygen. If it is below 88, only then there is an indication for oxygen. In, in COPD patients, just yanking up the oxygen is dangerous because those patients can end up with retention of carbon dioxide and become more drowsy. That can be dangerous. So please use oxygen. 92 for all patients with advanced chronic respiratory disease it is enough for them they are used to that so just because they are breathless is not an indication to start on oxygen please remember oxygen is also a drug unnecessary oxygen can also damage the lung with nascent free oxygen radicals so oxygen is not a panacea for all breathlessness patient might be breath patient might be having a panic attack Patient might be anxious, patient might be in pain, patient might have got a bad news. So you need to explore before just shoving up that nasal cannula. And the other important, most of my respiratory condition who is so breathless. Do you want to kill the patient? So please remember morphine in very tiny doses is very, very effective in making the patient reduce the sensation of breathlessness. It does do nothing to the lungs. It decreases the work of breathing. It decreases the air hunger. It makes the patient less anxious and the patient feels less breathless. Only the sensation of breathlessness is reduced. And please remember, it does not worsen the hypercapnia and it does not worsen the hypoxia. I have patients of COPD and ILD on 9 to 12 milligrams of morphine titrated slowly as per their needs 
walking talking and comfortable the aim being focus is improvement of quality of life their underlying lung disease is incurable but they call up to say i managed to talk a full sentence or a full 10 minutes with my grandson or i managed to eat with my family today or i managed to go to the toilet on my own these are the small victories these patients are looking for who are chronically breathless and who are completely dependent on their activities of daily living so we start with very low doses and we try to treat as per their needs with connection with the patient and the way we start is a small 2.5 mil and slowly titrate to 8 hourly 6 hourly and 4 hourly please do remember if you have a very sick patient who cannot take orally then we adjust the dose to subcutaneous or intravenous third thing we add benzodiazepines when there is anxiety or we add midazolam when there is panic attack so because breathlessness can be compounded by anxiety if it doesn't settle with all your measures oxygen niv bronchodilator steroids nebulizers everything you add morphine and c and if still the patient doesn't settle there could be a factor of anxiety please address that along with all your non pharmacological techniques anything at this point because i always like to stop uh uh at this point and discuss morphine shri priya what happened our team got disconnected me co host oh what happened here i didn't see that uh, yes ma'am we were facing some technical glitches so now you are back uh, yes ma'am i am back with my personal connection but you can continue ma'am let us see like is it okay uh, Wait, yes, i can make you na one second you just want to become a co host na but any questions about morphine i would like to at this stage ask any experience with morphine at uh, for breathlessness um any thoughts concerns you are the co-host shri priya yes ma'am that's why my message it was sorted <laughs> thank you yeah yeah yes anybody any doubts any queries or can i go on ma'am i had a question um... yes Oh uh, ma'am is there can you introduce any... yourself ma'am yeah, Shaurya uh, yeah yeah ma'am ma'am ma I'm Dr Shaurya Mehra I am a second year postgraduate resident in uh, department of radiation oncology at government cancer hospital MGMC Indore okay uh, so ma'am I just wanted to ask that uh, is there any just for practical purposes can we keep any saturation cut off in our mind while we are prescribing something like morphine maybe even iv morphine if you are giving anything so for telling saturation morphine doesn't do anything to the saturation that's why i made that slide that it doesn't worsen hypercapnia hypoxia or anything so what morphine does is reduces the anxiety it does reduce the respiratory rate because our patients are going at 30 to 35 right so little bit reduction of respiratory rate it reduces the anxiety it reduces the work of breathing therefore it also reduces the ang- and because it reduces the anxiety and work of breathing patients feel less breathless it's not it doesn't alter the oxygen dissociation curve it doesn't worsen the hypoxia in fact with morphine we have seen patients improve because they ventilate better the tidal breathing improves so actually the gas exchange improves a little bit because also they are less anxious so morphine is very safe in small doses the maximum dose is 30 unlike pain there is no ceiling dose for management of pain and morphine but in breathlessness we do not go beyond 30 we don't need to go beyond 30 the idea is only comfort the idea not to knock the patient there's a difference but we do 2.5 bd and slowly make it 8 hourly and if the patient needs 6 hourly and then 4 hourly because morphine is removed from the system in 4 hours but it works wonderfully it is people thank you for especially because they have lived all their life breathing at this this makes it little bit better so we tell them to take it before bath we tell them to take it before physiotherapy so that they are able to perform these activities and they are able to feel better because that is what their quality of life is they are able to do things they enjoy thank you ma'am yeah okay so this is the other uh, uh, reference which clearly shows that oral morphines and parenteral help nebulized morphines don't and there was no instance where carbon dioxide rose or the pao2 fell 
so you can look up this article it clearly shows how significant it is to believe me and i also encourage all of you to have discussed this on your rounds with your seniors because there's a huge opioid phobia amongst doctors amongst patients amongst caregivers and even though india has a large production of morphine our patients don't end up getting morphine and our patients die really a miserable death so in peep situations where you are not able to cure you should use this judiciously but with scientific explanation and it really does work wonders people who have the indication for morphine do not get addicted to it so you and me if we take it for just a sore throat that like that's what's happening in the us they are going through the other end where people are all addicted to morphine and that's what people get saying you are giving me a narcotic drug will i get addicted but if you give it an indication of pain or breathlessness it attaches itself to the mu receptors and it does not cause addiction and therefore it and these patients need to be comfortable right and for his blood sugar to be controlled there's a difference it is not that you're taking it for a high you're taking it to feel better and feel normal as much as you can okay so <clears throat> another important aspect which i should point out at this time is terminal breathlessness so those patients who are actively dying okay of advanced respiratory diseases and you know almost all patients before death close to 80 to 90 percent who do have the death rattle have their respiratory altered their spine strokes breathing there's apnea breathing breathing is altered and it is very difficult for relatives to watch and for the patients to go through that kind of suffering especially if there is a palliative care integration in in advance then these families have decided not to go to icu not to be on the ventilator this is comfort care either at home or in the ward or in the hospice or wherever that patient is and therefore it is important to know about how to deal with these patients when they are actively dying what we currently do is we combine a, a morphine along with midazolam and give it slowly over 24 hours through a subcutaneous syringe pump this sedates the patient that's why it's called palliative sedation for terminal breathlessness so patient is not awake and aware of his distressing symptom family sees the patient sleeping silently and the patient transitions in peace he is not like a fish out of water where he is breathless he is restless he is agitated and if the patient has agitation we also add hand. then we have this administ administered even at home with a good efficient general practitioner some affording families have nurses in the house they administer it and it's usually reserved for the end of life so it doesn't go on and on it's maximum for 24 to 48 hours till the patient transits so careful selection of patient communicating to the patient and the family the documenting what you are doing with the patient and then starting palliative sedation because patients become unresponsive they will not be able to say so you need to say your goodbyes and everything before you start the palliative sedation so patients can transition in peace and we give them the dignity and respect they deserve any thoughts so this is what is palliative sedation where the intent is comfort the intent is not to end life life would have ended anyways for that patient because of his advanced illness what you have done is you have just made it more comfortable for the patient so patient transitions in in peace with no and the relatives don't watch the patient suffer because as dame cecily saunders mentioned the manner in which a loved one passes away is etched in the memories of those who lived on live on so it's very important for us to focus on the mental health physical health of caregivers because they have also looked after these patients of advanced lung disease not for one two years for many many years yes shweta can't hear you you're muted and i hope you're not driving uh ma'am am i clear now yes okay uh ma'am sorry to interrupt you but uh, i am working in an intensive care setup right now i am an, an anesthetist come intensivist so uh, while uh, we uh, we are talking of giving a, a palliative sedation uh, is it not somewhat similar to euthanasia no 
exactly my point which i was trying to make in euthanasia you give a bolus dose of a lethal injection and the intent is to kill in palliative sedation you give 10 mg of morphine with 10 mg of midazolam over 24 hours and the intent is comfort so the, there's a big difference it, it sounds looks like a gray line but the difference is intent is comfort so have you heard the doctrine of double effect where yes ma'am yeah what is the doctrine of double effect there, there you get something good but it might end up in something bad this patient was going to die anyways what you have done you have given a low dose of a medication to make him comfortable euthanasia is not legal in this country and according to me in a country with no palliative care we shouldn't even be talking about euthanasia why do people want to die because their symptoms and their distressing symptoms are not controlled because patients have no access to palliative care Yes. they are distressed not just physically emotionally socially psychologically financially in every way nobody addresses nobody talks to the caregivers are you coping well are you you know nobody supports these patients if a patient symptoms are addressed he or she doesn't want to die the reason people want to end their lives is because their symptoms are not controlled so when you are giving euthanasia medication clearly you are giving a dose of a lethal injection woof into the vein intent is to kill here the intent is comfort that is why you have to talk to the family you have to prepare the patient and the family communicate document get another doctor to see that we know what we are doing and start it so slow that 100 ml goes over 24 hours it's such a small dose of morphine that it is not what causes the death the illness causes the death but you need to be a great communicator and doc and you cannot say ki main palliative sedation chalu kar raha hu that's not going to happen you have to work towards it your disease is incurable you know you don't want the ventilator how can we keep you comfortable this is comfort care it is not euthanasia so i will forward you another paper i'll give it to shri priya about icu and palliative care so this is called withdrawal and withholding of aggressive treatment you stop life sustaining treatment and give the patient comfort care and i have done it and i have not been in i'm not going to jail see why do people get lawsuits shweta it's because of poor communication if you have communicated well nobody in their hour of grief is going to go to the court of law saying this doctor is negligent if you have sat with the patient you have explained to the patient if you have documented what you have said if you have explained to the family you will be safe even if one member of the family is not clear about it you don't give it it's very evident it is not what you think is right <laughs> you need to know the patient and the family have understood it so it is clearly not euthanasia i will send you papers to read it and in fact where i feel palliative care is least practiced is the intensive care because the mentality is to keep doing things i'm not saying your intensive care icu is trained in such a manner that you have to keep doing they feel letting go is giving up but you cannot save all your patients 25% of your patients don't shouldn't be in icu 90 year old with alzheimers with aspiration pneumonia what are you going to get by intubating that patient his dementia is not going anywhere his aspiration is not going to improve by intubating similarly motor neuron disease why should that patient ever go on a ventilator but that patient also deserves comfort right so please remember we are not talking euthanasia we need to improve our communication skills we need to know palliative measures to palliate distressing symptoms and these things do not it's not like you start the drip and the patient dies well the patient can die because it's so critically ill but please remember the do bo bolus dose it's not given woof and the patient dies it's not that have i made myself clear shweta yes ma'am thank you yeah so can i go on or there's any other doubt what dose of morphine midas 10 mg of morphine 10 mg of midas in a syringe pump given over 24 hours very very slow oral dose of morphine is 2.5 immediate release is what we use twice a day then slowly increase to three times then six, four times and then six times if the patient needs otherwise we even in make it 5 mg twice a day or then we do 5 2.5 2.5 5 depending on the requirement of the patient so it's very slowly titrated 
<clears throat> if there are no further questions let me just go through i think i have to stop at 6:00 uh, Uh, you can take excess time, ma'am, because if it benefits the participants learning, of course we. No, have... but it's it's very boring to constantly talk. They also should talk. So I'll proceed with the cough again. Very distressing. Though it's a protective reflex, it can be very very distressing when it is persistent and irritate. It can affect sleep. It can affect eating, and it has all these complications of rib fractures, cough syncope. People have incontinence, etc. and you must remember that cough is also not just respiratory it could be cardiac it could be gastric it could be upper respiratory it could be ent it could be drugs and it could be radiation and some children cough for attention so you really need to be very careful before starting off them on various treatments some peep kids can do it for attention seeking so please remember that when you have a patient of distressing cough go through these lists ask them about when they have dinner when they lie down if they are obese then they can have reflux induced cough and simple lifestyle measures can reduce their cough okay so the again cough also you can do pharmacological and non pharmacological like for example there is <coughs> like i said sorry <coughs> so <coughs> breathing techniques or lifestyle changes to decrease cough can be a big part of non pharmacological things and for pharmacological again you need to check things for example if they have interstitial lung disease or copd you need to check if they are taking their medications you need to check if the inhaler technique is right sometimes very often we write the inhaler and the patient's technique is wrong so please check these are small things that you can do and of course there's a, yes uh, ma'am i have i just want to ask you one thing that with clinically can you differentiate the cough of different diseases that from the time you mentioned like what time did you have food yes that way also like uh, the cardiac so typically i'll tell you if it's respiratory yeah. you have to have had an history of asthma or copd or interstitial lung or pneumonia or something and typically the history will be cough dry productive postural drainage with cardiac causes it will be you'll have a history of diabetes hypertension ischemic heart patients complaining of orthopnea letne pe khansi hoti hai so i have to get up and sit or cough which comes at 2 to 4 am when there is a sign of lvf gastric cough very typically episodic cough it comes while talking laughing bending it comes after food or it comes on lying down only because the food gravitates and irritates so history taking really helps suppose you have a ear ent problem ear ache upper respiratory that also can cause cough so your history taking can actually guide you whether it is respiratory cardiac gastric or or ent or it could be a combination that's why your investigations will help you lung functions your uh, you start a trial of uh, you know pantoprazole or uh, uh, domstal domperidone if you start an anti reflux medication you ask the patient to walk after dinner you ask the patient to take a gap of 3 hours and <clears throat> you know one of the things we tell is have breakfast like a king lunch like a queen and dinner like a beggar in india it is exactly the reverse everybody eats the biggest meal is dinner the digestion and metabolism is very slow after 6 o'clock and as you grow older it becomes even slower so gens when they eat before sunset there is a logic to it even scientifically your bowel movements are very sluggish after 6 so if you eat a large meal it just sits there and that can cause a lot of cough okay thank you ma'am thanks thank you. so <clears throat> opioids again low dose like you treat for breathlessness helps in refractory cough but i would always like to suggest you start with simple things like local uh, things like hot water hot water gargles some lozenges some uh, codeine uh, syrups and then proceed to opioids and in the meantime explore if there is anxiety issues see if the patient has some uh, drugs which cause cough and if the patient is not able to sleep etc you can add a diazepam a uh, benzodiazepine etc so that the patient sleeps in the cough and you can also there are some other interesting medications like gabapentin uh, in refractory cough if you start gabapentin which is actually a medicine for epilepsy 
you start with a low dose of 100 milligrams at night and then increase it to 300 milligrams because gabapentin also the side effect is sleeping, drowsiness. So patients, there has been papers reported that refractory cough actually improves with gabapentin. So it is important for you to address distressing cough because solving that can greatly improve the patient's quality of life. Then we come to pleural effusion. Again, distressing because a lot of malignancy can re result in recurrently filling pleural effusion and it can be very distressing for the patient. How do we treat pleural effusion? That depends on the, on the prognosis of the patient. So if the patient has a prognosis which is more than four weeks, you actually then do aggressive like a pigtail so that the small indwelling catheter goes into the pleural space remains there, you drain the fluid slowly and then do a technique called as pleurodesis to fuse the two layers of the pleura. If the patient has very limited prognosis, you just aspirate it once and hope that it doesn't refill before the patient dies. So it all depends on the severity of the patient's illness, his performance status and <clears throat> the response to treatment as well as the drainage. If the patient is going to live well, you should do aggressive treatment so that he can live well for how much ever long he's alive. But if he's not, you do just one aspiration and let him be comfortable. Hemoptysis is another thing that you need to know, especially in patients with cancer, etc. You need to warn them that they can have a big bout of blood coming out and it can be very scary. So for such patients, you should prepare them with dark towels, reassure the family and the caregivers and they need to have an action plan. If this happens, you reach this hospital, you contact this person for this procedure. Depending on the cause of this uh, hemoptysis, there are many things we do like bronchial artery embolization where we go through the femoral and we actually fuse the bronchial artery because maximum bleeding occurs from the bronchial circulation in the lung. Second thing, they, if it's due to a tumor, then there is laser done. They could cryo be done endoscopically through a bronchoscope. We also do stenting so that we bypass the tumor and arrest the bleeding. You can do a rigid bronchoscopy and push medications like tranosamic acid to stop the bleeding. But management of hemoptysis becomes complicated at home. If the patient needs intervention, the patient must reach the casualty. Please remember that patients of hemoptysis die not because of loss of blood only, but it's also because they aspirate blood and they choke in their own and they drown in their own blood. So exsanguination is one thing. Aspiration of blood and death is much more common, especially if there's a large bout of blood hemoptysis suddenly. So <clears throat> these are how, how we palliate distressing respiratory symptoms. So these are the things we can do for patients. And one last thing before I uh, we get ready for the case presentation is I need to highlight how important the pandemic has brought focus of the palliative care because respiratory physicians and like all of you, all doctors are tired, exhausted, overworked, frustrated, and there doesn't seem to be an end. So therefore, palliative care is something that has really helped all of us tied over this, to be honest with you, because this is a humanitarian crisis. A large volume of people are affected. So many of them critically ill. And the manner in which this whole pandemic has behaved, isolation, quarantine, alone, loneliness, away from family. So it's very scary for a patient even to be in hospital. Everybody is in PPE. There's such complex uh, loss of lives. Some families have lost more than one people. So, so much grief and only palliative care concepts can actually help us and the families tied over this mess. So, we must remember, like I was telling Shweta, which patients will you admit in the ICU? All COVID patients who are critically ill cannot get admitted in the ICU. We do not have those many ICU beds in the whole of India. Even America and England came to their knees with the best infrastructure in, the, in public health. Still, they couldn't cope with that. So we need to triage and select patients properly. And that should apply to even non-COVID patients. Just because they can afford is not the reason to go to ICU. Talk to your elderly patients. Talk to your patients with chronically ill as to how and where they would like to be treated when in an emergency. So <clears throat> very important to talk to patients, talk to caregivers. Let us plan the goals of care for patients. 
let us have clear idea of what the patient is going to achieve by attending an ICU, going on a ventilator. How are we going to improve the quality of life? Because quantity of life is not everything. Unfortunately, we are a death denying society. Even doctors are not trained to talk about death and dying. And pally, the pandemic has got death and dying into sharp focus. There's so much fear because especially in the first and second wave, people were just going, dropping dead. And that's why it's important to talk about it because we are all going to die. Therefore, we all must talk about it and we must talk about it to our patients. It is our responsibility. So palliative care in the ICU, very important withholding care, withdrawing care, difficult dialogues because we've had patients who have repeatedly got admitted with fibrosis. And what are we going to achieve if the 80% of the lung is fibrosis? There is no point keeping that patient in ICU, especially in a pandemic situation. Post-COVID, another big factor for palliative care because a lot of patients have fibrosis. And it <clears throat> really dips their quality of life. So what we do in post-COVID is rehabilitate them with physio, small doses of morphine, try to counsel them, especially some of these patients could now not have many of their family members. So they are depressed. So a lot of palliative care can go into post-COVID care also. And these are just the definitions that you should know about what is acute COVID, post-COVID and now long COVID. It's important because palliative care is a huge aspect in treating patients with post-COVID interstitial lung disease, which is a very important thing that we all see as respiratory physicians. And just to end this, I would like to tell you the needs of people at the end of life is irrespective of whether they have cancer, dementia, COPD, cardiac, stroke. We are all humans. We all have emotions. And palliative care is need-based. Palliative care is not diagnosis or prognosis based. Even in an acute event like the COVID pandemic, we all needed each other's support. We all needed to be there for each other to help tide over this mess. And please remember, this Snoopy thing really hits it. You know, we live every day. We should live well. We die once and we need to do that well for ourselves and our patients. Yeah. So with that, I will stop sharing. And throw open for all of you. Any questions? Any thoughts? Have I stunned you to silence? I don't want... I want more discussion. Uh, GB John has said, please repeat what doses should we start in a patient with chronic breathlessness? After how many days? Yeah. So usually we start 2.5 milligrams 12 hourly. And we roughly evaluate weekly unless the patient reports early. And one thing I have forgotten to say, and I'm sure uh, people would have read the hand that prescribes morphine must write laxatives. Even a dose of 2.5 can constipate a patient and a chronic breathlessness patient constipated is a deadly combination. It's horrible because they are uncomfortable. They can't push. They get breathless. So we cannot, we have to avoid that situation. Is that clear, GB? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to the case? Any questions? Uh, Shaurya has written, ma'am, could you suggest the role of steroids in patients with lung cancer? So steroids helps in massive pleural effusion. We feel it reduces some amount of pleural effusion. And if there's lymphangitis carcinomatosa, <coughs> steroids really helps in decreasing the anti the inflammatory reactions that the lung brings just like how we saw in the cytokine storm of covid what steroid does is improve survival in because of the it's the best anti inflammatory that man has discovered so in those two situations it helps otherwise and it gives a sense of euphoria so in patients with lung cancer that can help so that the patient's mood is a bit elevated appetite improves so those kind of small things can happen but lymphangitis and uh, plural effusion, there is definitely a role. And other thing is if the patient has underlying COPD, airway disease, then steroids can help in uh, making the patients breathe better. Ma'am, any specific agent? So we you normally use, see, in interstitial lung, we use pulses of methylprednisolone. With, see, airway disease, with the plural effusion, with lymphangitis, we use hydrocort usually. We don't use much of DEXA. Uh, but it can be used, but we use hydrocort and methylpred. 
मैम इंटस्टिशियल लंग डिजीज पेशेंट दे मोस्टली कम वेरी फ्रिक्वेंटली विथ एपिसोड ऑफ ब्रेथलेसनेस एंड वेरी फ्रिक्वेंट hospitalization <coughs> is there anything ma'am that we can reduce the frequency of hospitalization and i don't have much experience but i am seeing a lot to suffer with uh, where do you work disease. where do you work ma'am i am in uh, polyclinic echs tezpur and there is a mission hospital assam? also yes ma'am so you should meet your palliative care physician in assam we have a list with palliative okay, india ma morphine will really work extremely well to keep patients at home to make them feel less breathless mm -hmm. less hospitalizations better health utilization and save their money one strip of morphine is 30 rupees these are we one hospitalization which is 30000 rupees but tezpur we don't have any i think nearest is gohati mm -hmm. uh, maybe i have to make a contact since i am doing this course now i'll take this yes. bit of interest we have a doctor called dr sangamitra bora in guwahati ma'am and I'll i think to... priya can connect you and yeah. i know in some small places uh, getting morphine is a problem that also palliative india will solve you don't get it here we so don't get that that also palliative india has a way of how to apply as a registered medical institute to hmm. get the morphine hmm. so there are ways we can work together so that Mom, please. it benefits our patient so please write to palliative india Definitely. and they will get back to you Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Adding to that, uh, Doctor Banerji, we do have a separate team, the state facilitation team, who will be joining this course in time, like maybe towards the last of the session. We will be introducing our regional coordinators, uh, all the regional coordinators to this cohort, who will be there to help you out, who will be there to guide you, who will be there to support you throughout the process. So thank no you, ma'am. I'm really interested because a lot of my patients are suffering. And I don't have any way. We do understand that completely, and we are here to support you, ma'am. Uh, Raja, ma'am, we do have a few more questions in yes. the box. Yes. Uh, I believe, Doctor Shaurya, you are uh, you had mentioned systemic steroids specifically, so I believe it was addressed. Yeah, he spoke about steroids. <laughs> Doctor Reshma, if you could be more specific about your peritoneum edema, do we have you with us, Doctor Reshma? We do. Till the time she comes back, Doctor GP again asks, "Man, for long-term chronic lung diseases like severe IL, what is the maximum duration we can give morphine?" there is no maximum duration you can give till the patient is alive because that addresses the quality of life so you best give it like i said now it's need based this patient is going to be chronically breathless because his interstitial lung is not going anywhere unless you do a transplant so for quality of life we give it till end till end of life can systemic steroids uh decrease peritone yeah yeah of course it can the problem in the lung more than the pressure see lung expand the thorax is a um, uh, what do you say tight compartment but unlike the brain the lung collapses to let the the tumor expand so there's no peritumor edema as such so therefore you can definitely try it but the point is the lung continues to collapse and what the patient experiences more than pressure is breathlessness because of the ventilator perfusion perfusion mismatch because lung is accommodative na the uh, the tissue keeps collapsing unlike the brain which is a tight compartment there is a lot of pressure in brain tumors there is a lot of peritumor edema and you can give systemic steroid lung tumor also you must remember that it causes other things like hemoptysis because it will erode the bronchus it will cause collapse it will cause cavity it causes other things because the lung tissue accommodates by collapsing so you i mean systemic steroids can be given if you think it's pressure but in lung it's very rarely that There's an another question, ha? Huh? That is done. Anything else, ma'am? Could you tell us what doses to give steroid serum? Which steroid? we, like I said, we give methyl pred. We give very high doses of methyl pred for interstitial lung disease. So we start with uh, six. We start with a good whopping dose of sixteen with prednisolone and hydrocortisone. Again, hydrocort we give hundred milligrams three times a day. dexa like i said we don't use much in the lung but methyl pred we use and we use hydrocort so hydrocort we start 100 mg three times a day and then give it for 5 days and slowly taper it 
and methyl pred also we use uh, at a dose which is 16 mg to start with and slowly taper off ma'am and the rattling death sound that when the patients are dying at home the lot of noises are coming and the relatives become scared they don't know what to do in those situ- i read in book this hyacin butyl bromide so or you can give hyoscine but you can give morphine also is it buscopan also. yeah buscopan can be given subcutaneously 0.2 okay. to 0.4 Sorry, twenty to forty. Glycopyrrolate is point two to point four. That I'll not give. Is best. Buscopan you can give subcutaneous. And the morphine also. Patient cannot be given orally. SOS, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can give that. You can give morphine also because death rattle is not just secretions; it's also altered breathing. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. And it is very distressing. Hmm. so who is presenting the case today shri shri priya be uh, happy to go yes ma'am dr sanjana okay yes ma'am i'm actually had one thing to ask about giving glycopyrrolate yes uh, the city the actin is reduces secretions or anything else no you, so you mentioned like about glycopyrrolate both hyoscine and glycopyrrolate reduces the secretions Okay, so okay. you know you can't treat you know we also don't think in palliative care that suction is a good thing you know very often stroke patients uh, parkinsons plus patients mnd they all drool and people keep suctioning it's very ghastly because it affects the upper respiratory tract and they have pharyngeal ulcers why do you do okay. suction because the patient is not able to cough out so you decrease the secretions and then do postural drainage so that it comes in the mouth and then you can do suction instead okay. of shoving it down the throat It's very cruel to do it in an awake patient. Uh, uh, my name is Dr. Sanjana. Uh, yes, Sanjana. Uh, 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 I, I think, think you. I'm a junior resident now. I'm trying to get MD palliative medicine if it is possible. For depends on that. Uh, hello, I'm audible, ma'am. you're audible but you're breaking so i think you should go off the video till you talk and then come back if that's okay is what i feel yes is everybody ma'am. else able to recommend that dr sanjana you can switch off your video and continue okay 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 uh, so this pain i met in trivandrum medical college he was admitted male with for who so had been diagnosed with uh, nadidor carcinoma um, with uh, a history of uh, severe breathlessness and he was found to have massive left pleural effusion i'm not sure how to go that okay. so this is one case of nadidor carcinoma like with, with Dr. Sanjana, do we have? Uh, can you change the slide, please? Hey, uh, yes. Uh, I am not able to change the slides. Hello, uh, Dr. Sanjana. If time allows, I believe you uh, may just uh, close off and log in. The history of worsening of breath. hello much better now you okay. can okay uh, okay the patient is having worsening of breathlessness since past one week the patient started having breathlessness at rest since past one week and he is finding difficulty to complete sentences due to dyspnea for the past two days he is he was able to attend personal chores and was comfortable at rest before so he was diagnosed to have left adenocarcinoma leg with spinal metastasis 6 months back and had undergone five cycles of chemotherapy 
uh, it taken after chemo uh, the the ct showed progression and increase in size of the tumor he was then given five cycles of radiotherapy also now currently he is taking morphine tablets for his pain in the back uh, for the last three months uh, he is taking 20 mg fourth uh, hourly pain is con pain control is achieved adequately so on examination the patient is conscious oriented is very distinct uh, trachea is in the center pallor is present is very cachexic is not able to finish sentences due to dyspnea and single breath count is 6 uh, on uh, on auscultation and uh, general examination the chest the air entry is reduced in the left side vocal resonance is impaired due to null not in percussion and uh, other parameters are acceptable uh, he is having desaturation in your uh, room air he is only having 80 percentage improving 93 percentage with oxygen gr okay. treatment and significant in, uh, investigation so we could manage to get an x-ray of the patient which shows uh, left hemithorax homogeneous opacification probably massive pleural effusion and serum electrolytes are sodium 126 potassium 3.5 rbs 406 urea 65 creatinine 1.1 uh, so psychosocial aspect the patient used to work as a security in a park near to his home he is still uh, going to work for the past one year due to his ill health he lives with wife daughter and son in law son in law is the daughter of a driver who is the breadwinner of the house his son is working in ernakulam the newly joined company as trainee his treatment excesses were wealth by selling gold and house he had his brothers and other family members are also contributing to his treatment so medication uh, he is given oxygen via mask wrong word it is iv and nebulization and adequate pain relief is given with morphine uh, insulin according to grbs is also given uh, so the main concern for him is uh, he is having uh, massive pleural effusion whether to drain or not uh, is the main concern uh, we had at that moment uh, because he was very listening and his condition uh, his uh, his saturation was not is uh, symptomatic symptomatically he was not very um, improving with the oxygen allowed uh, so the main concern is whether to go for pleural effusion drainage or not uh, summary patient has massive pleural effusion in the left side caused due to adeno costa malai he also has spinal metathesis his condition is acutely terminal uh, pleural type is therefore considered the nature of the illness and patient has relatives uh, patient and relatives are consulted regarding his health condition uh, patient clearly expresses wish to defer life invasive life saving interventions our uh, discussion for emergency in palliative care uh, end of life care and patient counseling uh, so actually what happened was this patient i managed to counsel the patient and bystanders regarding the terminal nature of the uh, illness and uh, how uh, it is not preferable for the patient to get admitted in an icu and i, I instructed the bystanders to give uh, morphine Uh, as well as needed when the patient was having uh, worsening of dyspnea so after uh, giving adequate dose of morphine uh, he was better he was able to sit up have some food and uh, patient expired within one day and that's all okay. so we can if we can uh... recap this is obviously not a very old patient <clears throat> which is what is distressing but unfortunately lung cancer has very bad prognosis what we have managed to do is shift the zero you know we diagnosing patients earlier so we feel patients are living longer but the overall prognosis of patients with lung cancer is still not as good it's definitely better than what it was when i did my md so when you are talking about the timing of pleural effusion i think in my talk i made it very clear that if the patient is going to have imminent death then don't do aggressive treatment comfort care if the aspirate the fluid is really big you just aspirate it once so that the patient can be comfortable you have done all the right things of putting the patient on oxygen giving the patient morphine what is important unfortunately is again start of conversations much earlier because emergency in a patient with lung cancer can happen any time for that matter you and me anything can happen at any time so the point is we need to have these discussions in place 
if you have a patient who is going to suffering from an incurable illness you must it is the onus of the doctor to start so what do you want to do in an emergency then he can ask things like what will the emergency be then you can start the conversations and the goals of care very very important whether she wants to be home whether he wants to be in the ward what are the benefits and disadvantages of being in the icu especially now in covid relatives are not allowed only one relative is allowed so those things it is our impo- our onus to discuss these things which is the importance of why we call palliative care also narrative medicine it's it's like a, a procedure when you do a procedure of appendectomy central line insertion talking to a patient and communication is also an art that you all need to learn and practice to become perfect because from a patient who completely doesn't want to hear about death and dying you will see that the patient wants to know of how he will be treated and it's very important to give the patient the autonomy to decide what he wants out of his life so these are the points that you very very important that you brought about that <clears throat> emergency is like i said hemoptysis is an emergency svc obstruction is an emergency in in which is very common in lung cancer these things you have to even if the patient will not have it at least you should have brought it up like a plan a plan b plan c we need to be prepared and keep all our options open yeah anybody else wants to ask something pertaining to this case if you can stop sharing anything else that you would have done differently i'm sure all of you have managed patients with lung cancer anything else you would have done differently how comfortable are you all talking to patients about death and dying definitely there is a very stigma regarding the by patients and by such as even doctors about the uh talking i think it starts from us a profession closest yes. to death and dying and we don't want to talk about especially especially what i have seen is many of the senior doctors i'm not blaming anyone but many of the senior doctors don't want to uh bring the death into the conversation and many people uh feel that i have worked in an icu icu and ward and everything so uh, most people think that a uh, patient dying is a failure of in our part Yes, so it is not true. natural. So I think uh, we need to that change have... that paradigm thought process. So I would request if you all have not read the book, I'm sure all of you have read Atul Gawande's Being Mortal. Please read that book. It really brings to perspective what life, what really matters in the end. So Being Mortal by Atul Gawande. The no. other book that you should read is uh, When Breath Becomes Air. so these are all things when breath becomes air is a true life story by becomes air paul kalanidhi he is an indian doctor a neurosurgeon who gets cancer and dies at the age of 38 and he uh, actually preserves his sperm before he starts his chemo and his wife has a baby before he dies he sees his baby and he dies so it's a it's a heart wrenching story and that's when he says how different it is when you become a patient how you think of life and death very differently and why should it be different for our patients they are also humans so, they are also one day um, one of my patient asked me before she was suffering from prostatic cancer so the terminal stage with lot of metastases and the treatment was going on in a multi specialty hospital also and the government uh, mean, under oncologist he was asking me he was crying before death one day he was crying to me he told me that i am very scared i am not a specialist i am a family physician so with my limited experience i don't know how to counsel him but he was crying all you have to do much. dr banerji is ask him the question why why are you scared i am very and scared and what are you scared of if you ask these two why and what this is what mm. dr rajgopal has taught me the chairman of palim india just ask this what are you scared of why are you scared a lot of questions ka answers will come 
a lot of things i have not said bye to my daughter i have fought with my brother i don't know how i'm going to die will i die alone will i die suffocating so many things come you just have to be there for your patient and just ask the appropriate questions and just leave it because things come point is we wait for too late to talk about it these questions should be addressed much before maybe he wants to say sorry to his brother or he wants to see his mother for the last time these are all very important things to get closure in life but you can't talk a lot about death you can't really do that took... on the death bed na you need hmm. to give the patient also time so we yeah. are a death denying society we do want to talk about it so there's a, another last book that i would suggest is catherine manix what really matters in the end we'll go through it and uh, valium india will have a huge more thing but these books left a lasting impression to my mind from the conversation that pertains to imminent mortality needs to happen much earlier i believe absolutely because seen covid now all of you have worked in covid patients come there was no time patients just died on our hands right and you realize how devastating it can be when patients just die like that in a chronic illness if you don't prepare the patient and family i have had people tell me aapne bataya hi nahi patient itna serious tha aapne bataya hi nahi ki itni jaldi patient mar jayega so the point is you at least it's not a order, exit order. option it's not an exit option for you you in your conversation have to be very sure ki this 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 and there is a chance of death aapko tension leni chahiye na aap aise mat kara kara koi bhi gussa ka so it is important for us to talk about it that is why i talked about the timing of referral if you have a patient with a chronic illness is coming back to you every time and you sit and think will i see this patient alive in the next one year if the answer is no you need to start talking to him about the fact that he's not going to get better he's only going to deteriorate his lung functions are bad is it and you leave it to him do you want me to talk about an emergency if he says no at least you have tried it's not that you haven't tried see every patient will not say okay doctor let's sit and talk about my death it's not going to happen nobody is going to say that you have to build that rapport you have to build that situation where they say okay i am ready now because he knows what he's experiencing he knows he's deteriorating daily he knows that yesterday he could walk five steps today he cannot even eat on his own so they know <coughs> the body it is for us to put that question on them very often our patients relatives don't want to tell the patient the diagnosis which is so wrong collusion is very wrong how will the patient decide whether he wants to go to icu or not if he doesn't know what he is suffering from or he doesn't understand unko mat batana wo unko cancer hai unko mat batana ye hai he will become dejected the reason they say that is because there is no support for the patients palliative care is that support exactly the reason why i feel euthanasia shouldn't be discussed in a country where there is no palliative care cannot talk of ending life we are not even treating the distressing symptoms once a patient's distressing symptoms the human nature is wanting to live right if he's depressed if he's in pain today if you have a toothache you don't want to feel like going to work imagine a patient with cancer pain how is he going to be happy he will say mujhe maar do isn't it any other question i don't want to delay you have finished a full hard day's work and going home and ready to sleep or have dinner or relax and not talk medicine so there's nothing i'm happy to wind up so the like, uh, when this patient was admitted uh, the main yes. question me and uh, my seniors and colleagues and everybody was having us whether we should go for a ct whether we should uh go for a um, ultrasound get a tapping because the poor location was there but it was somehow it was not um, it was kind of lock related picture so air and they was there so we were all confused what is happening in said everything we see is a shadow so we want to know uh, especially since the um, we i mean in the medical college and the, everybody they want to do all the investigation so what, what is about, the point na <laughs> see point, yeah what is the answer. point so do you need to really especially in a resource crunch country like india a poor patient why do you want to charge him 2000 rupees more to get a ct to know that this is incurable we already there no all his reports are there so this is rationalization whether we should do not do it's i agree it's of academic interest but there is a limit to that also you need that's why i feel that public hospitals 
teaching hospitals offer way more care, better care than private because there is no logic sometimes in private. If patient can afford, he will be on ECMO also. You know, is there a logic? For example, I'll quote a very simple example. It's not related to respiratory disease, but you know, George W. Bush, the father of the president of the earlier older Bush and Atal Bihari Vajpayee, both died in 2018, I think 2018. Both had dementia. Both were 90 plus. One died at home with dignity, respect, surrounded by people he loved. Atal Bihari died in AIMS ICU two months on the ventilator alone. What do you achieve putting a 90 year old on the venti with dementia? What is it? Because he was a statesman. All the more reason that because he was a statesman, he needed to be treated with dignity, right? What did we achieve? So it's very stark because we don't talk about death and dying in this country. And that's the change we want to bring from all these young people like you. So I'm so happy to see a lot of youth, a lot of interest. And like I always say that by the time I need palliative care, there'll be somebody to come and give me. From this bureaucratic process that he, uh, it really uh, falls in line with what happens in my hospital as well. Now, many a times we get prisoner patients as well, like yeah. because government set up. So we get yeah. prisoner patients. So this is like an unspoken permanent rule that if you have a prisoner patient and the yes. patient is of cancer and deteriorating, yeah. the prisoner should not certify in the hospital in general what let you need me, to transfer it. In let me ICU. just turn the lights on in my room. One minute. Sorry. Yeah. So that's the other thing. Yes. We have also treated a lot of prisoners. Like we had Kasab getting the best treatment in this, but you know, that is humanitarian. We cannot mix law and this. So, but I still think there is a whole concept of palliative care for prisoners. So, you know, there has to be, but you know, we have to sit and talk to them about their choices. What do they want? It cannot be done just because we're prisoner or under trial. We have to give him alive at all costs because finally we are losing resources of our country. Na? I mean, our nation, uh, people who can be salvaged, don't get those uh, facilities and don't get those uh, resources, which is wrong in a country like India. No, that, is where, trying, yeah. that is yes, where sir. medical ethics, na? autonomy, best interest, I mean, uh, to do in the best interest of the patient. Do not harm the patient. And the last is justice, which was so evident in the pandemic. Just because a patient is 90 rich with a fat bank balance, he should not be going to ICU and we lose a 40 year old who cannot afford to go into that ICU. So there has to be some justice because a 90 year old is not going to su survive a COVID pneumonia. Like Lata Mangeshkar, now she's on in the ICU for the past three, four weeks. She can afford it. Nobody talks about anything. I'm not wishing her ill but i can't even imagine what quality of life she's having after the covid pneumonia and after ventilator so i don't wish upon this to anybody you need to live with dignity with respect and you need to die on your own terms now you can't be just because you're rich and famous you cannot you're not immortal death is inevitable and a bad death is avoidable and the worst thing is madam i don't think she's even given a choice yeah, nobody asks for the choice. <laughs> the it's famous choice. you are, like Jay Lalita's death. I would be scared to be a Jay Lalita. My God, she was on three weeks on ECMO. This is not how you want to live. What is the point? Yeah, you're true. Nobody says, Aapko kya What do you want? Do we ask patients choices? What do you want at the end of a consult? Do you have questions? What do you want? It's very important. Tomorrow when we are sitting in that position, we feel very involved in our care. If somebody says, what do you want? Or what are your opinions? What have you understood so that you can make a decision? Yeah, so ma'am, aged old ladies and the patients, dead patients, even the people will do CPR for money. Yeah, which is, <laughs> that is of course corruption. You're not talking of that. Yeah, but that is, that is happening. That is happening. I have seen a lot. You know, we are talking of how much are we transparent with our patients. If yeah. you're honest, na, 
nobody is going to say tell me any human being you know in this world who stands in front of the lord and says bhagwan please keep me alive with tubes in every orifice with me in icu but keep me alive do you know of any human being who you think will pray for that what do we all pray that we don't get up awake uh, alive wo to hone se raha because according to statistics only 7% people die suddenly but do you know of any individual who says please mujhe kisi bhi halat mein zinda rakho you don't then why are our icus full because we don't ask anybody their choice and even if there is an elderly who says please don't take me to icu the children will say how can i let my father die how people will say that i am not doing anything for my father the point is you are serving your guilt you are not doing what is in the best interest of the patient this conversation can go unending so please read those books i have shared an interesting article shweta specifically to you and to the group about indian laws in the icu about withdrawing wind holding etc but it was lovely to meet all of you and i really wish we could meet in person but that i don't know when that will happen because i i know i have attended these sessions in pallium india personally about 5 years ago it was really a lot of fun to see what they do and how they do it so i hope at some point in life you also can get that opportunity that i got and it is completely transform my life so very often people say don't you get upset and depressed talking of death and dying i have actually started living life better because we know that it is finite so each day you live on its fullest so i think that's the message i would like and it's the same for our patients yeah have a good evening and in places which is cold i can see dr banerji already wearing one topi so stay warm and stay safe all it's very you. cold yeah i wish i could stay in a cold place where i could wear jackets and sweaters not in mumbai okay take care bye thank you dr raja mayer thank you for thank the- you <laughs> Uh, as you. usual it was a wonderful session as usual as expected a very informative and interactive uh, so uh, we would request you to kindly provide your feedbacks because uh, feedbacks have been decreasing in number even though we have around 50 participants logged in only 17 20 feedbacks are coming in so request everyone to provide their feedbacks because it is very valuable for us and so with that note uh, this is sri priya now with dr raja mayer signing off from the tips echo hub till we meet you in the next session with another interesting topic and another eminent faculty everyone take care stay safe stay healthy be happy bye bye you need to give feedback otherwise i think you'll end up getting trash faculty ha huh? i i mean <laughs> not that pallium has trash faculty i'm just saying it gives us an encouragement to do better yes bye bye it's nice